and technology education discovery. And uh, we have, as always, a great lecturer today. It's a particular honor and at the same time conflict of uh, interest declaration uh, to identify <laughs> that Dr. Tony Avellino uh, is one of my dear friends and colleagues and we go ways back. I'm gonna give him a more formal introduction later as his talk starts in the second half of this program. But uh, he's a professor of neurosurgery and chief of the pediatric neurosurgery service at the University of Arizona and the College of Medicine, Tucson. And he is not just a very accomplished and well-respected neurosurgeon and uh, businessman, but also a successful author. Uh, he wrote a book called Finding Purpose, A Neurosurgeon's Journey of Hope and Healing, which talks about how to prevail through personal struggles. And he's an ultra marathoner, and he's uh, done several journeys on the boats that became nationally famous in the Ultimate Catch series. He's actually uh, worked as a commercial fisherman in his time off. I'm not sure how he does all that, but he's had a lot of thoughts about how to find success and um, prevail in times of difficulties. And again, all of us in this post-COVID era are struggling with how our medical systems respond to this uh, global crisis and how they try to reemerge from this. And we thought that as we're in this strugglesome period, part two, more or less, that this would be a very great time to have this motivational and thoughtful speaker today. As always, we're going to start with some cases, and it's a special privilege to have as our guest faculty here, our colleagues from uh, Tacoma here, uh, Dr. Jos Kovey, Sarah, and uh, Dr. Mike Martin, who's just stepped outside. And we have three cases prepared that all are complications, full declaration. This is not an m, &M conference, but we want to critically review what went wrong. Um, and talk about spine-specific things, as always, and your comments in the chat room are welcome. I'm going to monitor them but also specifically in terms of how to handle defeat. All three cases have a different slant. Dr. Skuin, our Chief of our Spine Services here also, and uh, we will comment on those. So I think we're gonna start with Dr. Jim Hicks first, and uh, he's gonna talk about a Charcot spine self-declaration. We had a Charcot series last night in our Tuesday evening case conferences, and so this is kind of a case that we did not show, but we had a tremendous viewership on Valentine's Eve. I was really grateful for all of your attendances. This case was not shown yesterday. And a little self-declaration of made, Jim. Tonight, please dial in for our inaugural, um, uh, an evening with a spine surgeon session. It's a chance to get to know major players. And Dr. Ziegler and I are gonna have the privilege of interviewing Dr. Alex Vaccaro from the Rothman Institute uh, tonight. Uh, Pacific time is 5.15 to 6.15. It's a casual talk about uh, things pertaining to spine surgery directly and indirectly and a chance for you to get to know these game changers. So Tony, are you live? Just a quick audio check. Uh, yes, yeah, Great. yeah. Am I live there? Good, perfect. Yes, we Excellent. hear you and we now okay. see in close up. You were- Oh, oh my God, Jesus, my God. Great. Good morning. I like uh, the good morning, yes. I, I copied you. So this is uh, Tony meets Dr. Jim Hicks. He's gonna show us a case and Hello. then we'll ask our uh, faculty here in the room and yourself for commentary. And this is a Chapman defeat. A Chapman defeat, okay. All right. Let's uh, jump into it here. All right. Let's so welcome to Stead Talks. Um, so a bit of a modified presentation here, but we'll jump straight into it. Um, so we have a 48-year-old male, uh, history of a T9 Asia A injury uh, so many years ago. Uh, he's a fairly large uh, individual, and uh, one of his significant complaints is that when he uh, is sitting, uh, he suffers from an IVC compression, so he suffers from extreme uh, leg swelling and complications uh, 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 vascular complications to his lower extremities. Uh, he does have CKD and uh, he's a diabetic. Um, so oh, his. Let's, let's stop here for a second. So, oops. Okay, yes. So, t uh, go back one level. Tony, you, you have obviously a lot of experience with. Uh, meningomyeloceles, et cetera. This patient had something that I'd never seen before. He had a large structural defect, obviously a Charcot arthropathy. 
of um, basically destroying his L4 body. Uh, L3 to 5 is basically just a large cavity. He had developed something called IVC compression syndrome. When he would sit up with his large body mass, which you can see on that soft tissue CT on the left, he'd basically compress or enfold his uh, vena cava. So you got growth. Oh lower extremity swelling and uh, ulcers and everything like that. So um, just quickly, in terms of triaging patients, and so our, um, these are these boundary situations of um, spine uh, and surgical indications and doability. Have you ever seen anything like that? And again, in terms of um, uh, meningomyelocele, where and how do you counsel parents about uh, doing major reconstructive surgeries? Yeah. So. You know, and uh, so um, anytime you actually have a complex case, you know, it's it's uh, I um, I feel that it's very, very important is uh, uh, what you um, what you're going to do, um, because I feel that um, your ability to communicate the plan is actually key, you know, and um um, because my my experience has been is uh, is uh, having the patient and the families understand the risk um, is absolutely key, you know. And uh, and even though as physicians we often say that we're giving informed, um, uh, but uh, having the ability to communicate uh, the why and the plan effectively. And in a very simplistic way, um, and allowing the patient to understand all things, uh, you know, is um, I look back that in my career is uh, the uh, the biggest mistakes uh, that I made was really um, I didn't communicate as effectively as I should have, you know, and uh, uh, and you know and similar to complex Milo uh, kids is these are very complex patients with a lot of uh, heart concerns, lung concerns, you know, and so um, having the ability to um, uh, let the patient and their family know what is wrong, uh, what the diagnosis is, how to treat it, uh, and but uh, being sure that, that you communicate that plan over and over again, you know, and it's uh, a lot easier said than done. And in your pediatric realm as a uh, pediatric nurse surgeon, a very underserved area in our country with very complex cases, do you ever involve palliative care to kind of augment uh, the gravity of these discussions formally? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I don't usually get them involved um, until after the fact, you, you know, but, you know, but um, uh, with that said, though, Jens is, uh, you know, is, uh, is if you know that it's a complex patient uh, with uh, a whole host of concerns, having them involved earlier is uh, wise. Great. Dr. Covey, I'll bring you a microphone. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, this is obviously going to be a major slog with a literally 100% complication rate. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of taking on a case like this? Should this be done in center? Should this, should this be done by two surgeons? This is a Charcot uh, arthropathy. So we know this is a hypervascular thing and any suggestions as to how to handle this surgically? Well, I guess the one thing, should it be done by two surgeons that clearly makes a lot of sense on a patient like this. Um, um, and you need to, besides getting good fixation and extensive fixation uh, to get a good, uh, a good graft in the front, um, I think you can probably, you know, just tie off the fecal sac that might, and then try it all posteriorly, that might be an advantage in a big patient like this. Um, uh, but I'm not sure if this lends itself to um, a lateral approach. Uh, that would be, I would probably defer to uh, Rod to answer that. Um, 
you just need very extensive fixation and you need to hook it up to the, I'm not sure, I think the lowest level there is like, looks like T11. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably, I, it doesn't make sense to stop short and create the possibility of a Charcot arthropathy somewhere in between. Yeah, well said. So two uh, follow up points. First goes to Rod, second goes to Tony. Um, Dr. Covey mentioned the lateral approach. You're a master of the lateral approach. When in my beginning days at uh, Harborview, we tried to go anterior laterally to these cases. We found, and you can see it on that axial cut that Dr. Hicks is showing in the center, there's an extremely large inflammatory panis around this area. Uh, it's very hard to differentiate vessels. Um, nerves, in this case, with a paraplegic patient, we don't worry about as much, maybe, and we'll talk to Dr. Avelina about that. Would you be comfortable doing this as an X-lift? Have you tried this in these Charcot patients? There are actually great cases for um, the reasons you just discussed, because the lumbar plexus isn't an issue. On this one, the crest might get in the way, because part of L5 is gone. But it's definitely, I mean, I've done a lot of lateral and Charcot patients, because it gives you the ability to put a very large implant in, and we've done several where I think, you know, doing it from posterior can be done too, but it's, I don't think you can get the same end plate coverage. And doing an A-lift on a patient who's 395 pounds, anterior approach is not gonna be easy either. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tony, so Dr. Yeah. Covey mentioned ligating the remnant yeah. of the dural sac. Yeah. Uh, and last night in our Charcot debate, one of the areas that we all agreed on is to not do that because we never know what kind of remnants of neurologic function may be passing through there. Uh, what are your thoughts as an experienced neurosurgeon who deals with a meningomyelocele population? Is that something we can do? Is that something we can do yeah. about differentiated decision making, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so in those patients that I ligated things off, uh, were those patients that I knew were uh, that that I knew that had no neurological function, but uh, uh, but um, most importantly is uh, is making sure the patient doesn't have a shunt um, is uh, because in in a handful of cases that I've uh, performed with patients that have shunts, you have to be very uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, you have to be very um, careful, you know, and, and in fact, uh, for patients that have a shunt, I, I usually externalize the shunt first, uh, is because anytime you, you actually ligate the fecal sac, the uh, cerebral spinal fluid uh, flow dynamics is not the same. Um, and, uh, um, so knowing what the, uh, brain looks like first is, uh, very, very important. Great points. Okay, James, let's delve into my complication saga here. No worries. Um, so again, treating that Charcot arthropathy, a large construct down to the pelvis. Um, there was a, a large amount of blood loss, uh, during that case. And, um, uh, obviously we'll talk about the cage here. Uh, so moving onward, he was um, from out of town, and then he uh, had left town after his surgery, after seeking us for surgery, and then uh, had a complication and, and rehabilitation, uh, I believe two to three weeks after uh, procedure with uh, anterior extrusion of that cage. Um, so if I may editorialize there, Tony, and this is again my question to you. So. Uh, this is a patient who came from a state, and I'm not going to give any identifiers, far, far away. There's a substan assume that this patient had an extremely uh, um, prominent medical connection around the country. So there were a lot of eyes on this case. And we did all the risk disclosures. We did not involve, or we may have involved palliative care. I don't remember right now. But um, this was a very difficult case. I chose to go from posterior. I did not ligate the dural sac. I did use a unilateral root ligation to get this cage in. On the top is a CT, and it's very hard, an intraoperative CT, to show how the cage had engaged. I was not super happy with it, but I uh, and must admit I struggled with getting a good visualization with the cage in place. 
place. Uh, it seemed to have a good purchase on the interoperative CT scan. The patient left our state by jet to a far away other state to have uh, rehab because I very much in these Charcot patients try to change how they mobilize. And again, he had this IVC syndrome, so we mobilized him and they he fell. This is not a huge surprise and voila, the cage was no longer there. So now we have this patient in a state, yet again, far, far away in a nationally prominent facility with a medically highly visibly connected family and there are multiple additional eyes on this patient now. So my thoughts to you is how do you handle this? Um, any suggestions? Uh, should you just tell this patient because assume the patient has to fly with a um, private jet, he can't be commercially transported. Um, do you tell him come back under all financial circumstances uh, or do you try to uh, kind of negotiate with local surgeons whether he should be taken care of there? which was a major surgery the first time. What are your thoughts in terms of how do you handle this with a large amount of visibility on a complication like this, which is not unexpected, but which we obviously don't like? Yeah, so uh, uh, so it seems like the patient has, has the means, uh, you know, and so um, my rule of thumb is if there's any complication uh, with my hands, it's better, um, it's better to uh, transfer the patient back um, is because you have the uh, rapport uh, with them. But uh, with that said, it's corresponding with the local team there, um, you know, is because I would uh, uh, suspect that uh, on a complex patient like this, um, since they went to you, they probably want to go back to you and uh, you know from a medical legal uh, standpoint um, any um, complication I would rather have it solved in my hands. So you tell the patient to uh, get on the next uh, private uh, jet and uh, fly back up here? Uh, if they're uh, if they're medically stable enough to travel yes salvaging this um uh, dr martin did you see this case discussion this is a complication of mine uh, just or, the last couple minutes okay well I go to yos yos can you uh, because he discussed this first any salvage options what did i do wrong and what can i do to fix this now i went from posterior i went uh, posterolaterally to put the spacer in this was over 10 liters blood loss well, I, I think, you know, it's, can you please, of can course, you speak closer to the microphone, is there? Yes, I, and the blood loss is, is probably somewhat less of a concern with a revision because you're only within weeks. So your dissection is probably still there. You don't have to uh, do too much with your instrumentation. Um, so you just have to focus on this uh, cage. Um, I'm sure that at the time you put the cage in, you rattled it and had really good fixation. Um, uh, so I think a different, you know, it, this might be a sort of case where one of those cages with uh, these old harms cages with have a lot more teeth and grip, but are much harder to put in uh, and maybe also harder to dislodge. Um, or you could still elect a lateral approach here and take it out and then try to get, as Rod said, something with uh, a larger foot plate. Although this, the foot plate on this doesn't look small, but uh, I know with the lateral approach, you have these cages are a lot wider, at least from uh, uh, in the lateral plane. Rod, um, go back to the same approach or go lateral to fish this out and revise this. Um, I think you can do what you did, but I think you can also consider going in from the front. I, I don't know if there's a CT, but I think, I mean, I fished out cage, cages uh, like this. You just have to watch the vessels. So James, take us forward. All right, so uh, replacement of a cage, there's probably a better shot on the next um, slide. Um, and actually, I, I'm not sure which approach was taken to replace this cage. I believe you went posterior again. I just went through the same approach again. Right. Um, but in accelerating forward here, 
um, he's done well uh, with this revision. And then the far right lower corner um, is where he is about, uh, I think it was about one to three years after his, his surgery. Um, so he actually healed. The main thing is I was very grateful to the family, but uh, it took a lot of phone calls uh, with the surgeons and the nationally renowned Southeastern Major uh, Spine Center. Um, and all of those surgeons, I'm very grateful to their discussions with the family uh, and then having encouraged them to fly back up here, uh, go through that additional expense. Um, I was still worried, uh, Rod, look at the post-operative yeah. CT scan. I mean, the vertebra above and below had split when the first cage popped out. So this is a new, different type of a cage uh, with a moderately larger footprint, just like what Dr. Covey said. Uh, and we anchored it with multiple cables so it would not kind of translate forward. So on the bottom, axial shot you see represent I think I put six or eight cables in we put a quadruple uh, we put a six rod construct into him there's no AP um, he's followed up and he actually healed us and he got rid of his ulcers and when I recognized Dr. Gottlieb who helped greatly with the soft tissue coverage in this patient and he actually healed this thing against all odds but it took a lot of additional conversations before and after it's the second surgery as Dr. Covey had suggested was still bloody I think three liters blood loss or something like that yeah, not near, um, nearly as much but uh, it was never torrential it was just a steady very widespread ooze that we're fighting with but these cases are very unforgiving uh, and we'll see that in the next case also and puts great strains on our mechanical and biologic fixation but also the physiology of patients but beyond that the emotional engagement is very high in these patients and does not stop until they're healed and never totally stops any sure. thoughts from you and as you review this case uh, Jim yeah, I think um, maintaining those relationships with your patients, no matter where they are in the country, um, especially such a big, big procedure. It was great that he was actually able to come back and, and get that revision surgery. Yeah. Um, so just maintain those relationships, even as difficult as it can be, I think is important. Yeah, I know that was exactly what I was very grateful. And again, uh, your teams have to be very good also, because it's quite common that we get questions or complaints later on from patients and in a very busy practice they can get lost and uh, it's very important that you somehow have really good team members who kind of look at things very aggressively right. and have not afraid or uh, never hesitate to, to contact you if there's a question right. about something. Right. So thank you Jim. Right. Dr. Jared Cook is going to show a different slant on a complication and he presented this case very briefly last night in our Charcot Tuesday evening conference and um, he didn't have much time to present it, so we can talk about it a little bit more. It's a different version of a, how to handle a complication. Okay. So I am uh, Jared Cook, orthopedic spine fellow. Um, so uh, the patient in question here um, had a history of a spinal cord infarct, uh, T5 to uh, T5 and T6. Um, uh, back when he was a teenager, so I was in his uh, 30s um, at this point. Um, presents at, uh, so at presentation here, came in with spastic paraplegia, um, wheelchair ambulator uh, for, uh, for longer distances, um, uh, had at baseline neurogenic bowel and bladder, um, says non-smoker, but vaping until uh, fairly recently, um, non-drinker uh, daily cannabis use, uh, so mostly uh, weakness in the bilateral lower extremities, um, uh, actually, uh, you know, likes to do, uh, you know, modified uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, so this was initially what he, uh, what he came with when he presented to an outside, uh, an outside provider. Um, and uh, so this is the earliest image without hardware that, uh, uh, that exists in our system. Um, so this was uh, thought to uh, potentially be of infectious etiology. So uh, the patient was indicated for a, uh, a IND posterior fusion um, and uh, uh, cultures uh, came back on that uh, negative, um, but this was the construct at that point. Um, so this patient has a significant transitional anatomy, so we're calling this L23 um, uh, to keep things consistent. So can you go back one? Tony, so um, do you have the x-rays on him also, or do we have those as later ones? Uh, no x-rays. I, I wish we had x-rays. care <laughs> preceding us. Um, when you see these kind of um, destructive arthropathies, 
a common thing is that they're di diagnosed as discitis, osteomyelitis. How often do you see this in your uh, meningomyelocele population in pediatric uh, uh, age groups? Yeah, so uh, so in the peds, uh, we uh, don't see it very, very often. You know, it's a, but, uh, but in our myelo patients, uh, especially the um, older ones, uh, the incidence of uh, um, uh, the incidence of decubit eye uh, in their spine uh, back is is actually very high. So, so the uh, one question I have is tangential to this, but very important. Also discussed last night in our Charcot um, session was long-term follow-up of uh, paralyzed patients. You're a pediatric neurosurgeon. Do you have an 18, age 18 cutoff, or is that kind of a pass-off? Is that an organized kind of yeah. long-term rehab? Yeah, stuff? yeah, yeah. So, I, so uh, uh, one of the most um, important things in peds these days is uh, how do we transition? Um, and, uh, and luckily, in um, where I'm at now, um, um, the PEDS hospital is right at the uh, right at the adult hospital, um, and and um, so it's relatively easy. Uh, but uh, what the state of Arizona has is they have this uh, state program called the um, the PRS, um, and uh, and it, it's probably a, a program that's been in existence for uh, years, and. Uh, um, and, and the state provides funding for uh, a few clinics around the state. And so these Milo patients uh, are followed from birth to 50s and 60 years of age. So, uh, Very good. Yeah, this is something that is sorely missed in our regions. And again, we have excellent rehab doctors, uh, both from UW and here at Swedish, and they're very experienced, but somehow getting a program uh, established where uh, patients with paralysis, and this patient's yeah. probably paraparetic so, technique, um, can be followed up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, so um, um, I often say that the two important things why um, it's not that easy is one, they're often uninsured, uh, and then two is they're the most complex patients that oftentimes uh, getting a physician that uh, feels comfortable with them is very, very, uh, is actually very tough to find. Well said. Jared, without going to too much detail, you gave a very nice brief differential diagnosis. Don't pull up those slides unless you have it. What makes this a Charcot arthropathy and not a discitis osteomyelitis? Give us the highlights of your uh, summary slide last night. Um, well, one of the things is, is uh, this, uh, you know, hypertrophic remodeling that, uh, you know, that you see here, um, you know, that, that's more, um, you know, more likely to uh, be a shark call. Also, um, there was uh, the uh, patient's labs, the ESR, CRP, um, you know, were normal. Those, you know, we would expect them to be elevated in, um, you know, in discitis patients. Um, so those are, uh, those are really the, uh, the big ones here. That's also kind of just the pattern of, uh, breakdown of the vertebral bodies. Uh, now we go go back one. So there's. I want to point out a psoas abscess on the patient's right side. So on the left side on the screen, uh, seeing that coronal. Does that uh, lend itself towards discitis, osteomyelitis, or what? Um, it was. Yeah, I, I'm not totally sure what to uh, what to make of that. That's um, an abscess, but okay. Yeah, I mean, just the situation. How often do you have a infection or infectious materials in a Charcot patient? Um, you can you can get it fairly often, especially with a propensity for decubit eye. I mean, they're, they can get seeded um, mm -hmm. for sure. But if I understood you correctly last night, the key thing is that you recognize that this is actually a neuropathic arthropathy primarily mm -hmm. with a secondary infection and not something that an infectious organism caused as breakdown. Right. And the pathophysiology of healing is way different in a neuropathic joint than in a infectious situation. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Great. Now go forward one. So as we're seeing this, um, Dr. Covey or Dr. Martin, whoever wants to take on the microphone, 
many hospital administrators nowadays tell us we should do MIS surgeries because the patients can't get out. What are your thoughts in terms of this kind of a surgery? We know this is going to fail, but what are your thoughts as you're under these pressures of doing less invasive surgeries when we have, sometimes have very significant pathologies? Well, I would tell them if they want to do a minimally invasive surgery to come on down and do it. Um, but <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, there's a role for minimally invasive surgery, but um, there are some things that are not appropriately managed. And, you know, this is one of those uh, cases. But I think you hit the key point is recognizing that, you know, this is a neuropathic joint, uh, primarily uh, not an infected one. It may be infected on top of it. Um, but uh, addressing that neuropathic joint uh, should be the, the mainstay of uh, that treatment. The IV antibiotics are, uh, are fine, but the construct has to uh, address that neuropathic joint. And one thing that Jared said last night, I think the delay to actually getting definitive surgeries over two years in these patients, they're usually subjected to serial aspirations bracing, antibiotics, yada, 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 and get sicker and sicker from the antibiotics sometimes. Is that fair? Uh, that's fair, yeah. Uh, yeah, the delayed diagnosis is huge in this, and part of that has to, you know, do with the fact that the presentation is, you know, an average of 17 years after the injury, so it, it's, the association's not made. All right. So we'll assume this fails. Carry on. Uh, well, we can see it failing, uh, basically, you know, at the first post-op visit. Um, so, so hypothetically, uh, Dr. Martin, if you don't mind just following through, what would you have done in this setting? Well, not that. I mean, I'm concerned about the, the two levels above that. It looks like there's something going on up there, too. Yeah. Um, well. uh, so the treatment for this is... Um, a long construct, um, probably down to the pelvis. Um, the last one of these I had, I sent up here. So, uh, uh, but not that limited uh, thing, which was uh, probably designed for what was assumed to be infectious disguidus. Dr. Avellino, so um, you've done a complex spine fellowship. You do uh, very complex pediatric cases. Um, neuropathic arthropathy, Dr. Martin very astutely picked up that the disc spaces um, don't look normal above. In a situation like this, and based on your current pediatric practice, do you recommend going to the pelvis? Should we kind of just do a multi-level post fixation, leaving some motion segments intact in a spastic paraparesis patient? Wait, you're off. Your sound is off right now. Um, in a patient like that, I think uh, doing a long fusion is wise, uh, you know, is because these uh, uh, spastic paraplegia patients, uh, you know, are really tough, you know, and so, um, you know, and so all their, uh, all their spasticity and movement, you know, and so uh, is, uh, I would suggest going long. Hey, just on a tangent here, spasticity is one of those underrated major problems, especially of incomplete spinal cord injury uh, patients. Is there anything new to kind of modulate that beyond um, uh, muscle relaxant medications and uh, baclofen pumps, et cetera? Is there something that's yeah. a functional a neurosurgical part, if you put that hat on, that uh, can offer yeah. for these patients? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, uh, selective dorsal rhizotomies have been actually used, and, and really, uh, uh, for spastic diplegic uh, patients, they actually work very, very well. You know, but uh, but you know, but I think the uh, besides meds, the uh, intrathecal pump uh, and uh, that, you know, but you know, is, is I think you know, uh, with that said, though, is my complication rate of putting in intrathecal pumps isn't actually uh, low, yeah, you know, and uh, um, and um, these are patients that are very uh, complex and have a whole host of issues, and so uh, even though the pumps are easy to use, um, um, the aftercare of them is uh, it is actually very tough at times. Great, yeah, insightful things. Jared, carry us forward in this case. All right. So, so recommendation was made by our panel here and by Dr. Avelina to go to the pelvis probably. 
Uh, well, um, at the time, the uh, treating surgeon opted to uh, observe it a little bit, um, and uh, you know, further deformity, um, you know, occurred. You see, just at that level, the uh, you know significant you know retrolysthesis that uh, is happening, also that uh, breakdown that we're you know noticing two levels above is, uh, is progressing. Um, so at that point, the patient you know was uh, you know was referred here, and so uh, those recommendations uh, were you know also the recommendations that uh, that he got from uh, from this institution. So a uh, T5 to pelvis with a quad rod construct um, with uh, satellite rods uh, spanning the um, uh, the area of you know most instability, you know, being that uh, that affected Charcot area, um, and. Uh, you know, then from there, stage two um, was uh, going in laterally and, uh, you know, lending support um, to uh, that L2, 3, and 3, 4 um, area with uh, uh, lateral cages. Um, Rod, as an expert in far lateral yeah. surgeries, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, PEAK, which was used here versus titanium nowadays, looking back at these kind of cases? Do you prefer titanium now just from its biomechanical uh, as well as biointegrative capacities or is Peak still a I mean, great design? That's an excellent question. I actually like bone the best. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think, you know, now we're, when you look back on, I think Peak is probably doesn't have the best properties for bone healing. So I think I prefer bone, then metal, and then obviously there's a lot of Peak options too. Same question to Dr. Coveo, Dr. Martin. Uh, titanium, is it making a big comeback now? Peak, overrated on the way out? What are your thoughts as a cage? I like peak. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've just recently started using a little titanium, but I've seen titanium cages that, uh, that have these integrated things, not necessarily mine, because I haven't followed them long enough, uh, that, um, don't seem to integrate uh, as well as advertised. And um, you know, I think peak under pressure is like, you know, very much like bone and it seems to integrate pretty well. I know you hate it, but uh, it, it is this, there's also this peak with titanium coating, uh, which um, probably is the best of both worlds. I'm a little bit of skeptic at this point about titanium. Yeah, that's no, fair. I mean, again, I, I always uh, consider peak now in the retrospective lens, and I use plenty of it as the great wall in the Game of Thrones uh, uh, lexicon. Um, what makes this a satellite rod, uh, Jared, just quickly on that tangent of multi-rod constructs? Um, so you have uh, so you have rods that uh, that span that uh, unstable area that you're you know that you're really targeting that are not connected to the uh, to the spanning rods uh, spanning rods being the uh, the full length rods that go from the top to the bottom of the construct. So these are um, pure satellite rods. Is there a biomechanical difference to accessory rods or kickstand rods? Uh, well, as far as uh, jury's kind of out on some of that. The kickstand rod is used for uh, for deformity correction. So it um, in uh, in the coronal plane. Um, and really what I've seen from you know satellite rods, it's often used for closing osteotomy sites. So that the use tends to be, you know, tends to be different, but um, I don't think that there is a standardized use. We're still trying to figure out what we can do with it because we know that it can strengthen um, uh, areas locally, uh, unstable areas locally. So uh, I think the jury is still out based on what research exists currently. So self-advertisement, we have a publication out there called the Lexicon of? <laughs> so the, uh, Actually, what's the exact uh, title? The Lexicon of Multi-Rod Constructs? Yeah. Um, Who's so, the first author? Is Dr. it you? Dr. Ramey. No, Dr. Yeah, Ramey. it was just Ramey. <laughs> Wyatt Ramey. Um, and like uh, he's a graduate of the University of Arizona and uh, had a lot of hits. And you have recently finished, and it's in peer review, so we don't want to give away too much, but you did a formal, the first formal systematic review and meta-analysis of a multi-rod constructs and long fusions. In a verbal nutshell, what did you find? I uh, found that um, using uh, using multi-rod constructs, uh, generally speaking, can't speak to satellite versus accessory rod, um, uh, uh, decreases the rate of rod fracture, rod fracture, pseudoarthrosis, and reoperation. Um, you know, compared to dual rod constructs, uh, mainly in the setting of uh, deformity and osteotomies. 
Great. Now let's fast forward a little bit. So there's a series of sequelae now that's happening, and we probably have to accelerate a little bit so we get to our last case. Okay. Um, so to you know start off um, uh, at a. Uh, you know, at follow-up, we see that there is a, a lucency of the um, uh, S1 and um, uh, and pelvic screws, um, and you know, at this point, um, patient was uh, uh, was revised or thought that a, a stronger construct was necessary. So, um, uh, so multiple pelvic screws uh, bilaterally reused. The um, the uh, quad rod construct was um, was changed up a bit, and so now the um, the way that these you know rods are are being used are in um, I, I guess technically we would you know call them accessory rods, but really they're part of an overall connecting construct. Um, so uh, the classification for that um, you know forthcoming. I won't say too much there. Um, but after that, um, it comes back, and if we look in the bottom, um, the bottom right hand uh, side, we can see that there's a rod fracture. It's now um, the construct is disconnected from the pelvic screws uh, on uh, on that right side. Um, so, can I, can I interrupt you, Dr. Avellino? So, in my experience now with. Uh, Paraplegic patient. Now, this is a spastic uh, paraparetic patient again. Uh, is lordosis desirable, or should we actually fuse them into a flat back uh, formation? In your uh, experience with patients with um, paralyzing disorders in the younger generation, do they like a flat back better for sitting posture, et cetera? You know, it's. Um, I have not actually found that yet. You know, and uh, I mean, it's. Uh, um, is as long as they're uh, in, uh, I think um, having them in balance is key. So, okay. So you're starting to see this fail. So go ahead, Jared. Let's fast forward here. Okay. So uh, continuing on. Um, so uh, in, in order to. Um, you know, try to get those uh, those lower levels to uh, to fuse. Um, uh, revision fusion um, was uh, was undertaken. So you see those bilateral cages at the uh, lowest two levels, and then going forward, uh, you know, longer timeline. Now we have uh, pseudoarthrosis. Um, so uh, and you know, loosening of the uh, the pelvic screws. So a uh, revision um, to uh, uh, a lift. Uh, was uh, undertaken for you know for the bottom two discs um, ended up uh, you know uh, fracturing one of those uh, one of those bone grafts um, and then patient uh, you know uh, patient kind of just continues not to uh, you know not to be able to uh, to heal this um, so we see a fracture um, of uh, um, we see so here we see rod fractures um, and it was uh, revised. Again, um, and uh, at that point, a, a partial corpectomy um, was uh, uh, was done. Um, you know, uh, hopefully to uh, to you know restore you know some sort of uh, uh, biomechanical stability to the area, um, and then at follow up um, uh, very shortly after, uh, patient managed to. Uh, while getting out of a car, felt a pop, um, and uh, one of the rods just, uh, you know, disconnected, popped those uh, end caps right out, um, and um, I mean, yes, they were vinyl torqued. It just, you know, uh, managed to fail in this manner. So from there, um, it was uh, taken back. This was, uh, you know, this was revised, um, and now at that point, from this time, no other. Uh, no other fractures on um, uh, on frequent close follow up that uh, this patient gets. So, a couple of questions. First of all, just uh, surgically looking through the unfair lens, uh, the unforgiving lens of retrospectoscopy. Um, Dr. Martin or Dr. Covey, whoever wants to take that on, what should have been done differently? I don't know that. I mean. The initial thing healed great, uh, like peak or not. I mean, that was like a million bucks up there. And you subsequently got the other one to, to heal. So is this, 
I mean, you guys have more experience with this than anybody. So I have a question for you. Is this um, how these things go? Uh, is this a, a process? Is this like treating diabetes or hypertension where you never really fix the problem, but you're you're treating the patient to get them? Or do you get some of these where you fix them and you never see them again? Honestly, the microphone. Yeah, uh, it's exactly what you said, Michael. Um, these are really challenging cases because you're dealing with the entire body, you know, and you know, they're paralyzed and like this patient, you know, it's really hard to get them to fuse. And um, this whole multi-rod thing, I think um, in these cases, I think you can't do them without multi-rod fixation. And I think, you know, Jens wrote early on in Harborview, his experience with Charcot patients. And that's kind of how everyone started using multi-rods. And the trouble is, I think what I've learned is that it's one thing to fix these to the sacrum, but you have to go to the pelvis. And then when you go to the pelvis, you not only have to go to the pelvis, but you have to put multiple fixation points. And I learned a lot from Jens doing these surgeries, but they're there to try to get the fuse. Yeah, we've, we've learned, and actually we had a consensus last night, which is rare in spine, uh, stacked, meaning multiple iliac screws, I think was one of the consensus points, and having independent fixation to the pelvis of the shorter, um, the working rod construct and the spanning rod uh, seems to be very important. So I think everybody actually agreed on that. Even Dr. Lieberman uh, accepted that multi-rods are uh, necessary, but there's biologically and biomechanically, as well as psychologically, very unforgiving. Question to you, Tony, so serial complications, it just will not work like what you've done despite best efforts. You've somehow miraculously avoided infections, you've miraculously avoided neurodeterioration, VTEs, et cetera. But how do you handle, what's your advice to surgeons in terms of serial complications? Um, be honest with the family. Uh, um, but you have to keep on working until it's solved. You, you, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you cannot get discouraged working as a team, bringing in uh, a whole host of uh, consultants uh, uh, um, will enable you to provide very good, uh, you know, but I, but I think honesty, uh, trust, and then communicating. Uh, but, you know, but, but you know, it's... Uh, but for these complications, uh, it's, you know, they're really tough uh, operations and you have to just keep on working. Is there a role for mentorship also outside of the direct care thing, ongoing mentorship, even for a senior spine surgeon? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, it is, um, um, I'm a big uh, proponent is to actually have a coach and uh, uh, to actually have um, uh, colleagues uh, uh, that have um, diverse experiences uh, enable you uh, to provide great care. Great points. All right, um, one more case, but this was like five, six revision surgeries, right, Jared? Yeah. We have one last case. Um, and full disclosure is a complication that I was involved with, and uh, Dr. Garrett uh, Lewin is going to talk about this case. Uh, and we will follow the principle of no blame. Um, very complex uh, circumstances. Uh, Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to present another Can case. Can you speak closer um, to the microphone? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I think that's, yeah, that's better. Um, it's about an 80 year old male initially presented with increased bilateral neck pain to his family doctor, um, radiating to both upper extremities since already two years, but with a worsening over the last few months to a significant numbness, tingling, complaint of decreased uh, grip strength, um, all mentioned by the patient. Um, there have been no spinal surgery in the patient's past, no recent fall and no improvement under the conservative treatment that the patient already received for several weeks. Um, if we have a look at the past medical history of the patient, we see that he suffers from um, small cell B cell lymphoma and various different other conditions. So um, what the family doctor did was sending um, him to the MRI. And in this MRI, we saw uh, at first multi-level degenerative changes and deformity progression. Um, also with a grade two enterolisthesis of C2 over C3. 
um, severe multi-level central canal stenosis throughout cervical spine. Um, also, uh, we can detect it on the height of C2, C3, um, a myelo malacia. Um, and I think we can do it on the, uh, see it on the CT, which I'll show in a few minutes better, but we have a chronic type 1 odontoid fracture as well as a chronic actless fracture with a subluxation situation here. So um, after the patient um, showed up at his orthopedist, um, after the images were, were taken, um, he was referred to our clinic. He still presented with neck pain and stiffness, radiating to both uh, of his hands, um, which was now the dominant pain. So the radiating pain was dominant right now. Um, Paresthesia in both hands, slight weakness, um, and as well symptoms of imbalance that the patient hadn't recognized before. So we had uh, to make use of a walker um, Yeah, when he did longer uh, roads. So, Moreover, um, he had a left foot drop since five years already, and he just remembered as we asked him um, that he f had a fall two years ago backwards uh, on the sidewalk onto his head, which pretty much matches to the early beginning of his symptoms. So um, during his consultation at our clinic, we also performed x-ray images. Um, what we saw here is uh, already from the MRI, we knew about the C2, C3 anterior diseases. And what we see, especially in the dynamic um, images uh, during flexion and extension, that we have a dynamic translation at about one to uh, two millimeters. So moreover, we made CT imaging, also for the preoperative planning process. And as we already saw in the MRI, we had a multi-level degenerative changes, deformity progression, severe multi-level central canal stenosis, especially in C2, C3. And what we see here very clearly um, is also the chronic type 1 odontoid fracture, as well as the still ununited atlas fractures. OK. so. Um, for sure, this anatomical condition could not be remedied uh, with conservative management. Therefore, um, the risks and limitations of the surgical intervention were discussed with the patient, including his family, especially considering the patient's current situation, medical history, uh, and also the risks of further neurological damage. Um, so an urgent posterior occipital cervical thoracic procedure was planned with the occiput to T4 decompression with posterior instrumentation. So the surgical procedure was performed without any complica complications. Uh, the vital parameters were stable during the whole time. Um, the patient met the extubation criteria right after surgery and was extubated by the colleagues of the anesthesiology. Um, at first, the patient was still stable, but then, still in the OR, he developed a progressive respiratory distress. Multiple attempts over a duration of about 30 minutes of reintubation and ventilation failed, including percutaneous cricothyroidotomy, open cricothyroidotomy, radio uh, endoscopic visualization, and still then during chest compression. Uh, due, um, due to the cardiopulmonary arrest, all these procedures were performed. So finally, open cricothyroidotomy was successful in establishing an airway, but viable blood pressure and oxygenation could not be reestablished. So after consultation with ICU attending, the thoughts were stopped after around 60 minutes. So this disastrous tragedy case um, surely arises um, many questions. At first, as you always ask, could this have been prevented in any case? Should have been taken more precautions into, into account? Um, I had to be the, the interdisciplinary communication better in, in any way. Um, but moreover, the situation of the involved person of the medical staff as well, because um, it's 
pretty hard to deal with such a highly demanding and stressful situation. And I think an experience like this surely leaves its marks on every individual involved. So if you can go back to the MRI scan. So Tony, we can obviously talk about multiple things like the surgical decision making, but this is one of those things where uh, we had very thoughtful, careful, and well-documented discussions leading into this. And um, uh, this is one of those crisis situations. As you know, I think of the spine as an organ system. I think it should be qualified as such. And if you look at the flexion extension films, then this is truly one of those no-win situations. The surgery went very well. Um, there was no big bleeding. I was thrilled how it went. And I assume part responsibility for the coming. Can you go to the x-rays? Again, this sure. is a truly unstable craniocervical junction, not survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I see that. There was clearly a communication breakdown in terms of uh, extubation versus intubation and no finger pointing because I'm part of that communication team to make sure that everybody is on the same page and stays on the same page. Uh, but a catastrophic outcome happened, uh, which was in retrospect probably avoidable. Aside from the usual um, hospital assessment, of course, there are root cause analyses and this and that, multiple meetings. And of course, in this acute setting of multiple people fighting for the life and the well-being of a patient and family communications, documentation needs, et cetera, what is your advice, what are your thoughts on handling the surgeon, the provider trauma that invariably happens that we're exposed to that, so, and that makes our job so hard? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so uh, this is a really important thing, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's um, uh, when a medical error or an untoward um, complication arises is, uh, is having uh, peer support um, is absolutely important. You know, it's, uh, you know, is uh, uh, bad, bad things occur, but, uh, uh, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of places don't have the support systems in place, uh, but what I think the COVID pandemic has done, though, it, it's really elevated the um, uh, wellness uh, initiatives, peer support to a another level. Uh, because before the COVID pandemic, is, is um, um, I'm I'm not sure if people really um, understood things very well. Uh, but but I but the burnout rates are so high, but uh, one of the reasons why is uh, you know we need to provide better peer support, um, especially for the younger uh, physicians. Um, it's uh, and uh, you know some hospitals have a peer support uh, um, in place. Um, others actually don't, but I. But, but I would say that most places have employee assistant programs where uh, physicians can go to actually get help. Um, uh, you know, but, but it's absolutely critical that when something occurs, uh, when something bad occurs, have the ability to debrief, uh, but, but uh, um, not the, you know, um, supporting the physicians as well as the patient and the families is uh, is actually key because uh, physicians are going through the same nursing staff, uh, you know, and so, I mean, it's, uh, uh, but anyway. In a setting like this, and I want, don't want to cut into your presentation time, do you yeah. kind of debrief with the OR staff right after the event? Because again, everybody is just shell-shocked in this whole thing. What's your advice in terms of the acute management of the provider trauma uh, aspect? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so most programs that uh, I've been involved with, uh, you know, um, giving it time, but uh, debriefing the uh debriefing the next day to let the emotions um, to die down is actually key. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you, Garrett. Uh, thank you for this thought-provoking discussion also. Um, and uh, maybe we can re pick up on this theme after your talk with our group here. By the way, Tanya Nguyen says hi, she's with us, and uh, you remember her from UW days. She's uh, of course. Uh, active and doing great. Um, 
So, uh, Dr. Tony Avellino, as I said earlier, is a long-term friend and colleague of mine. He was a previous fellow. He was a successful resident at UW and uh, went all the way to vice chair rank, uh, was a program director, and um, he is now in Arizona, at the University of Arizona, the head of the pediatric neurosurgery program. Um, he's had multiple leadership roles around uh, uh, the time from UW through Arizona now. He's an MBA also, so he has an administrative hat, and he has gone through a lot of personal uh, insights that he's going to share with us in his uh, open fashion. He's a nationally recognized speaker on this. He's the author of a successful book, Finding Purpose, A Neurosurgeon's Journey of Hope and Healing, which I highly recommend uh, and appreciate uh, that book very much, and I've uh, sought comfort in it many times and wisdom. He's also put himself through major challenges. He's an, uh, an endurance athlete. He's an accomplished uh, ultra marathoner, and he's been on the Saga ship. That's the uh, vessel that's become famous from the deadliest catch, and I think he's done two or three journeys on it. So, Tony, thank you for joining us to talk about something that we sure. uh, ignore frequently, and that's our personal wellness and uh, trying to really perform at a best possible level. Uh, yeah, great. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, Yenza, that was very, very kind, you know, but uh, what um, I would actually say is uh, I remember meeting Yenza when I was a first year resident at Harborview in 1992, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, Jens has been a great, great friend, and uh, um, he's done some amazing things too. So you know, but 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 the thing is, is I'm actually uh, very, very honored to actually be here um, uh, because since it's a new year, uh, it gives us uh, it gives us all an opportunity to pause. Um, and and Dave Sabi has um, always told me um, uh, is uh, you know what you know. Is there a difference between being a happy versus a successful doc? Um, and so, what I what I hope to do today is uh, three things. One is uh, share my story. Two is raise awareness of physician wellness. Uh, um, and then third is hopefully give you a, uh, a few tools uh, to think about to achieve a more effective work life balance. Uh, and so if we were live, is the one thing that I, I, I would ask to, uh, to start off is how many of you have effective work life balance? Um, and then the uh, second question I, I ask is how many of you drive your kids to school at least once a week? And the third question I ask is uh, how many of you see your grandkids at least once a week? So uh, with that said is so, uh, let me tell you about me. So I'm 56 years of age. I battled stuttering, depression, OCD, and suicide as long as I can remember. I chose to be a neurosurgeon because I sought to live a life that brings healing to those with neurological disease. I completed my training with a tremendous sense of pride. I entered and ended each day with the knowledge that I had given my own. I, similar to my colleagues, though, ignored the fatigue and underestimated the assimilated trauma of the occasions where you gave it your all but you had an unturned event or the neurological disease one. Uh, so September 12, 2009, uh, 13 years ago, my resolve was gone, replaced by fear of hopelessness. I lack the skills to respond to emotions that cannot turn for support to loved ones lest they lose their respect. The administrative, clinical, and personal stress has struck down my physical and mental health. And I often say that um, I wish I knew today, 30 years ago, because I would be a lot more. Uh, but, but, I, but I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic has made a lot of us to pause. Um, and I think having the ability to pause is really, really important. Uh, as you know, the pandemic has made many of us experience fear, anxiety, depression, due to the isolation, lack of structure, financial uncertainty, new work from home realities, childcare pressures. These stresses have all impacted our mental health. Uh, in fact, the um, CDC has recently, uh, the burnout rate of physicians and nurses is really high. Um, and so really uh, what I hope to do today is three things. One, it's how to effectively maintain performance, both physical and mental in a high functioning stressful environment like we all do. 
how to differentiate between endurance and burnout. And then third is hopefully give you uh, uh, some tools to achieve a better work-life balance. Uh, and and uh, I often say it's performance equals skill. And what I mean by that is if you're an elite spine surgeon, elite athlete, elite scholar, whatever you do, you can have all the skill in the world, but if you can't block out your interference, whatever it is, if you're not mentally well, if you're not mentally attuned, if you're not happy and satisfied, if you're not doing purposeful work, if you're not in healthy relationships, if you're not showing compassion toward yourself, it's going to be very difficult to uh, very difficult to perform at that level. Um, and so in 2009, Dan Coyle wrote a book, um, and in the talent code, he, he says, in order to have talent, you need three things. One, you have to have deep practice. And as surgeons and residents and fellows, we practice, practice, practice. But secondly, you have to have that ignition. And what they mean by the ignition, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, because I know that if I look at my career over the last uh, 30 years or so, um, have I done everything that I was absolutely wanted to do? Uh, but then third is if you have the deep practice, you have that passion, what you want to do, but you have to have a coach. Um, and I think a, a lot of the cases that uh, Jens has 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 showed um, is if you have an untoward event or a complication, having a coach or a mentor uh, along the way is absolutely key. Because because uh, I know that I didn't get to be where I am today if I didn't have mentors. Um, Long, long the way. But so two questions that I re really want to ask yourself is what does success mean to you? What does success mean to you? Is it having a healthy uh, lifestyle? Is it having that big house, that big car, that boat? What does success mean to you? Uh, and then third is, uh, is I know that in uh, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, the things that keep me up at night are not the hundreds of kids that treat that actually do well. It's that one or two kids that I uh, make an honest mistake or the neurological disease one. And I've been in practice for a long time. So I have over 40 kids out there that I hurt. And, and I know that um, a lot of the concerns, uh, mistakes, I guess, or errors I made, I had all the skill in the world, but I was not mentally ready. You know, I was in the operating room, my people was going off, you know. Uh, so absolutely being in the present uh, is actually key. So how to differentiate between endurance and burnout. Uh, so I often say, what do physicians need? need? And it's four things. It's very simple. You want to provide quality care. You want to be efficient uh, in the operating room, in the outpatient clinics. You want to have input and you want to be a, a appreciated. So how many of you have input? How many of you at the end of the day, someone says, thank you for what you do? Um, uh, so if, if you look at the uh, national stats, physicians are more than twice as likely to commit suicide than the general population. Each year, uh, roughly three to 400 physicians commit suicide. Mayo study, 7% of employed physicians considered suicide. Uh, but most alarming to me is women that are physicians, female physicians are two and a half to four times as likely as women in other. And, and I think this is really important because as um, as uh, uh, healthcare reform uh, takes shape, we have to provide better because uh, I often say that women physicians have more stressors than I think men. You know, they're oftentimes taking care of their kids, their spouses, you know, their parents. Uh, but when we're out of balance, um, that equals burnout. Because uh, we all need purposeful work. We want to have input. We want to be appreciated. We all want to have a sense of accomplishment. We want to be doing good for others. And taking care of ourselves and each other and striking a work-life balance is, um, is um, important. I, I was reading something recently, and uh, and it said that treating ourselves kindly and compassionately as we would treat a patient can be vitally important to a general well-being and sense of happiness. So ask yourself, how many you treat yourself kindly? Like when an unheard event occurs or something bad happens or something the way that you don't know why it occurred, how many of you step back, take a pause, and really are treat yourself well? Uh, so without a healthy work-life balance, we're 
we are risking burnout. Um, and this is really important because I know that over the last 20 years is I didn't really know the signs and symptoms per se. I thought from my football days, you had to be tough, you had to be strong. Uh, but so what are the signs and symptoms? Anxiety, depression, suicide, addiction, insomnia, apathy, loneliness, marital, family stress, anger, boundary issues, overeating, addiction. Uh, so, let, so let me tell you about me. Uh, something that I'm not proud of, but in September of 2016, I uh, committed to telling my story uh, because I often say that no one should ever be at the brink as I was. Um, so I was one of those stats. I was burned out, depressed. Uh, but if you look at my journey, it started in medical school, residency, but I found recovery through ultra running, friendships, and other coping strategies. Expressing, acknowledging our insecurities is vital, but it's how we deal with them and find inner peace that's key. And so let me tell you about me. September 12, 2009, I sat in my automobile with exhaust fumes coming through the window. I tried to take my life. I saw visions of my son. For some reason, I coughed and I stopped. I hit rock bottom. Uh, I've been through the employee assistance program twice. Um, but uh, but I was um, I never told anyone the story except my wife and uh, and um, another person. Um, that is the captain of the Fish and Vessel Saga. Because I was fear of losing my job, fear of not feeling good enough, fear of not being perfect, fear of never showing signs of weakness. Uh, and so um, what I want um, each of you to do yeah, is if you can take a deep breath in and a deep breath out, and if you are able to close your eyes, take another deep breath in, and a deep breath out. And just imagine if you can channel 20% of your negativity into positivity, imagine how much more peaceful we and the world would be. So if you want to take another deep breath in and a deep breath out, and then open up your eyes. Uh, but I would not be here today, and I would not have uh, uh, been so passionate if there wasn't uh, two events that happened um, in my life. Uh, so in 2020, 2012, it was truly a life-changing event. So let me tell you about a boy by the name of Matthew Metcalf. Uh, so Matthew Metcalf was a child that, was, uh, that had acute lymphocytic leukemia. He had chemotherapy, he had radiation. Um, when he was very young, he was cured. Uh, I was a young attending in Seattle. In 2003, he came to me, he was 11 years old. And when I saw him, he had a, a very malignant tumor called a gliosarcoma. Um, so I removed it. Uh, four weeks later, it came back. Uh, but I remember Matthew's dad was a truck driver. His mom was an OR nurse. Um, and I remember when the tumor came back, I sat down with him and I said, well, listen, you know, it, it's back. Why don't we go in there? You know, I was young attending, you know, we got to do it. We got to do it. And the dad looked at me. He goes, Tony, I'm a spiritual person. I'm going to take Matthew all around the United States in my truck. I'm going to visit all our friends and see if they're cursed. So about six weeks later, um, I remember the uh, neuro-oncology nurse giving me a call saying, uh, you know, Remember that kid? Oh, yeah. You know, I said, oh, yeah. You know, uh, his actually dad was a truck driver. He reminded me of me. Uh, uh, he reminded me of my dad. Um, and he said, well, he died. And I said, wow. So this was in 2003. So in 2012, I'm sitting in my office at the University of Washington and I get this book. And his dad wrote this book called He Chose Joy. Um, and I read the book. Um, I cried. I read connected with them. Um, and this is where the story gets um, cool. Um, and it's interesting because nine years ago, I tried to save their kid's life and I couldn't. Um, nine years later, they've saved more, my life more than, more than I could say. 
so my passion is ultra running. And if you look at your life, so, um, you know, are there things in your life that you do for joy? What makes you happy? Uh, because Dave Sabe has this always told me, can you be a happy and successful surgeon? So you can be a happy surgeon, you can be a successful surgeon, but can you be, be both? And I would argue, yes, you can. Uh, but, but think about what brings you joy. Do you like to exercise? Do you like to garden? Do you like to paint, music? Uh, so ask yourself, do you do something every week that brings you joy, that brings you uh, pause? Uh, so my passion is ultra running. Uh, long distance running is what keeps me connected with helping others, uh, both spiritually and emotionally. During some of my most difficult times in life, I found hope, healing, and purpose on the trails. Ultra races are just like life. You have to prepare, you have to start, you have to work as a team, you have to stay focused, and you actually have to finish. So if you have a complication, it's just like an ultra race. You got to prepare it, you got to start, you got to work as a team, you got to stay focused, you got to work at it, you got to finish uh, and so I'm an OCD, ADHD, P's neurosurgeon. So one of my grids after my uh, races, if you look from left to right, it's uh, when I do my miles, what time I'm going to get there, what I'm going to eat. Um, but it's important to have a coach and prepare. Um, so if you look on the lower left-hand corner, when I played football in college, John Repulch was my athletic trainer, was my athletic trainer in college. And uh, John Repulch is a uh, physical therapist, athletic trainer, he, uh, uh, and he stole, uh, uh, helps me. Um, Hallie Trezrell is the uh, woman in the me uh, woman in the middle. Uh, she's a, uh, you know, um, she uh, is my coach, uh, but you have to start. And if you look at the right-hand side, so remember Matthew Metcalf, so his dad, Dan, is there. So a lot of my ultra races that I do, his, uh, Matthew's mom and dad are there. So it's, it's, it's remarkable that how a patient could really change your life. And I'm sure that everyone uh, listening to this has multiple patients that change their life. Uh, but in life, you actually need a uh, uh, supportive team. Um, well, you know, I say one of my biggest accomplishments is being married for a long time. Um, um, but you have to stay focused and you actually have to finish. So if you look in the lower right-hand corner, so that's Dan and Sue, that's, that's uh, Matthew's mom and dad. Uh, but then the uh, second story that actually changed my, my life and what I, what I hope to do is share with you some tools to give you an opportunity to pause. But the second story I'd like to share, uh, share was um, uh, the story of how I met uh, a guy by the name of Ed Rapp. So Ed Rapp was a former group president um, in Illinois. He was a, uh, he worked for a, a cat to filler, a Fortune 500 company. He uh, came back to uh, Illinois from Singapore he was probably going to be named uh, you know, to a higher, higher position at CAT six months before he was named to a diagnosis of ALS. Um, and, and Ed taught me more about life. And so what I'd like to uh, share with you is three tools. Um, and I hope this gives you an, I hope this gives you an opportunity to pause. Uh, so in his work life tools, uh, you really need three tools. You have to make a plan. You have to, two, you have to improve efficiency. Three, you have to be a corporate editor. And what I mean by that is, first, you have to make a plan. Um, so um, what is your personal why? What inspires you to action? What is your life vision? I never had a life vision until I was 50. Um, what, what is yours? Mine is to be the best friend, dad, and spouse to make this world a better place. Um, but also, is I wasn't the best dad um and uh but i but i must say that after i met ed um i actually drove my kids to school at least once a week um not that i work less but i prioritized things that were important um i went to a dinner with my daughter once a week and i have coffee with my wife every few weeks and, and they're in my calendar so everyone knows uh, but also, you have to be willing to say no. 
uh, because how how many of you out there uh, say yes. yes? And so in life, you have to have the ability to say no. But two, you have to have improved efficiency. What I mean by that is when you're going through your training, and your jobs and work, you know, you're climbing, 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 climbing. And, but it's important that I say that every month you have to take a pause. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm hopeful that the COVID pandemic has give, given us an, an opportunity to take pause. What makes us happy? What do you like to do? What brings you joy? Uh, so in the morning, I, I always exercise. And the reason why, because I don't want to shower twice. Right, you know, and so I wake up, I exercise, one, do whatever I want to do. Uh, uh, do you walk the dog in the morning? You spend time with your family, breakfast. Um, second thing is email. Um, how many of you get emails through the days and everyone sees me on them? At the end of the day, you have 50, 60 emails and there's nothing done. Uh, and what Ed uh, says. Um, that if you're going to CC someone the email, make sure that that's a person that you want to CC. And I often tell people that for me, if, you, if you're going to email me more than a few sentences, I'm not going to read it. It's better to pick up the phone. Uh, third is from a technology standpoint. How, how many of you out there have iPhones? Um, um, how many of you sleep with your iPhone? If you're on call, fine. But, but why? Uh, you know, and so... Um, and I would argue that sleep is one of the most important things that you can uh, do. Uh, fourth is from a meeting standpoint. Um, and where Ed Rapp worked uh, at his corporation, Fortune 500 company, uh, is uh, their meetings are 30 minutes only. Uh, so, uh, uh, so how many of you sit in meetings that they go on for an hour or two, there's lots of spin and nothing occurs. And so uh, Ed says that if you want to meet or you want to have a meeting, uh, send out the material prior. What is the objective that you want to uh, uh, do? And so at the end of the 30 minutes, the question is answered and everything's done. But also as physicians and nurses, uh, you know, you can simplify your life your lawns, cleaning, and now they have all these apps about cooking apps, cleaning apps, dog walking apps. And so how are things that you can improve your efficiency? So um, it's really uh, making priority for things that are very important to you. Uh, third is you, you want to be a corporate athlete, healthy mind, healthy body, happy family, stress management, must be a habit, no excuse. What do you love to do? What brings you joy? Do you do it every exercise, uh, sleep, or, or you meditate, take walks. Uh, but the fourth thing is setting and managing boundaries. Separate your work and personal life. And this is a lot easier said than done. Uh, but, 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 but if you're not on call, is there a place where you're driving that you can disconnect the person and work life? Because I knew that with my kids, I missed a lot of my kids. And if I knew today, because when you're home, you have to be absolutely present, and it's not very easy. Uh, but lastly, what, what Ed told me is you get to choose what type of day you have. Uh, you get to choose what type of day you have. So remember, promise me tomorrow morning that when you wake up, you say, I'm going to have a great day. Some days are better than that. Some days are better than others. But at the end of the day, if you wake up, you're angry at your spouse, your dog, your kids, you are come to work, you're angry. Your day shot. Uh, so, so my wife really developed uh, this, and so life is like a marathon. But your have books. Uh, T is take time for yourself to live a peaceful life. A always eat healthy, exercise, and sleep. And I would argue that sleep is one of the most important things that you can do. How many of you get eight hours of sleep? How many of you get six hours? Of sleep? How many of you get five hours of sleep? So, sleep is one of the most important C is continually self improve and remain coach, T, treasure, thing. friends. I choose the day I have control disappointments and respond positively and smile and laugh. And so, you know, to conclude, we all must listen, learn, and heal with each other to achieve a healthier, peaceful, purposeful life without the focus of loving body and spirit. We must remember we're never alone and we must find hope, even in darkest moments, or less learned can give us insights and how to be light. Uh, so, uh, what I'd like to do is just end this. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, 
uh, when when I was going through a tough time, and his mom lived in uh, South Africa. And um, this is a poem called um, um, "Life Is a Journey." Um, no one knows who wrote it, but I like to read it to you. Um, we board this train of the airborne and are patient for the consequences. We believe they will always come from the conclusion. However, at some stage, then our parents will get off the train, leaving us alone. As time goes by, many of whom are siblings, friends, children, many will get off the journey and return to Will go so unnoticed, we won't even know that they vacated their seat. This one ride will be full of very sorrow. We'll be a healthy, loving, good relationship, making sure that we give her a day. Anthony, you're breaking up a this little bit. This mystery of this last journey, we are not now acoustically. We ourselves will make it. So we live in the best of us. Hey, Anthony, we had a hard time hearing you in the uh, last couple of moments. Because when the time comes uh, for us to leave our seat, we should leave behind beautiful memories. Thank you for being one of the I don't know when my stage will come. I don't want to miss the same thing. So, uh, so to, to end is uh, the... the uh, the important thing is if you see a colleague in need, please take off your doctor's cap and listen, because truly you can save a life. Uh, so uh, with that, I hope I've given you a few uh, tools, uh, a few things to pause. Um, but, uh, but, it, but I think as you go through the journey of life is um, uh, connecting at the heart with people that you love and the relationships. And, and I think now since a new year time, and it gives us the opportunity to pause. So with that said, again. Great, thank you so much, Tony. Thank you so much for being open and uh, uh, very straightforward and offering us a multi-dimensional uh, uh, insight. Uh, the train video uh, auditory uh, um, uh, comments of yours were a little bit hard to understand. Something happened in transmission. Oh, oh. But um, I think the message was very clear um, mm -hmm. and very evocative. So here's my question to you. Uh, this is just a vignette, but this is one that's very pertinent. Two major factors have happened in the recent uh, couple of years in medicine. One is the emergence of electronic medical records, which basically, yeah. in addition to the email crisis, over inundated us for unreimbursed uh, artificial work tasks. The phrase has been clicked to death, or uh, um, uh, and that's very significant. The second one is the bureaucratization of medicine. That's closely linked to the EMR advent since 2000, where basically administrative overheads and um, uh, kind of uh, controls have uh, really changed our lives dramatically. And like the cases that we showed, especially that one with the multiple revisions, they're now clearly held as failures of surgeons uh, fiscally in addition to all the emotional and medical complications. So when we have comp take on complex cases, we're now held fiscally responsible also for the wellness of our institution in addition to all the other challenges. So some words of wisdom of how to yeah. cope the EMR stress and yeah. how to handle the the administrative uh, overbearance, I shall say, towards the practice of medicine. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so all the administration roles that that I've done, we're in my admin administration cap. Is, uh, is is I know that as a CMO, I I always uh, um, propose that if you're going to add something on to a physician's or nursing plate, what is the one thing you're going to take off? Uh, because oftentimes they just keep on adding things on and on and on. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, a few things I would say is that is why physicians and nurses have to be at the table. Um, that's, that's one. Uh, two is, is uh, 
physicians and nurses that are leading organizations, I think, need to be on the trenches too. Uh, because if you look at my my career, even though I've done lots of administration roles, I always did peds, nervous surgery. I always practiced. I always took call, um, and I learned the most when I was on call. Uh, but three, uh, the third thing I would say, if you remember that slide, what do we want to do? We want to have quality. We want to be efficient. We want to have input. We want to be appreciated. Um, and I think now. Uh, I think the COVID pandemic has made healthcare systems more aware of this, and, and hopefully physicians and nurses will have more input um, uh, because having input, but, but you know, the EMR is um, interesting in that one, um, it's burdensome at times, uh, it's clearer. Um, I know that in my practices, uh, one of the best practices I ever worked with was uh, in the Midwest, I, I worked in a private practice uh, setting, and it was absolutely fantastic because um, when I walked into clinic, um, uh, a nurse called the patient a few days prior, auto-populated the EMR. So when the patient got there, when I saw him, the nurse went through I saw the patient at the end of the visit. All I had to do was type in my assessment plan, uh, and I clicked the button. It was billed, and I was done. In contrast to the academic setting now, was, uh, you know, oftentimes I know that when I'm in clinic, my day isn't done. Uh, you know, and so, uh, so how does um, artificial intelligence, how to, um, how to customize templates? Um, uh, because I, I think there's things that we could do to make the EMR more efficient, uh, but physicians and nurses have to be at the table. And the administrators have to listen. Well, Tony, thank you. We're out of time yeah. now. But yeah. This was a time very well spent. And we, again, thank you for your honesty and uh, the the insights that you have as we're trying to do a good job in a profession, which is so rewarding, but can be so frustrating at times and uh, very mentally challenging. And uh, nobody better than you to relay this message uh, to all of us as you've been so successful in amending the uh, injuries and the wounds from the past and moving forward. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a bunch, Jens. Thanks. Thank you. All right. See you guys.